Right, cool. We're, we're on, right? Andy, absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, uh, I am excited by this. And the reason I'm excited is the, the, the UFO topic has always interested me. Like, it, I, think on a sub, I think it interests everyone, right? It has to. Yeah. But it's how much they allow their interest to be public. Because it's got a massive stigma attached in some areas, isn't it? But, and it's hard, it's hard to tell, the, tell what's you know, real stories and what's not and what's leg, a legitimate source of information and what's not. So I, I like the subject of UFOs cause, or other things that are out there apart from us because you know, on the balance of probability, there's stuff out there. There's a whole raft of evidence and, and information goes back, not decades, it goes back millennia, right? But uh, obviously, the closer we get to modern day, then the more, uh, the, the more easily verifiable it is that, that a sighting or an experience was real or completely mm -hmm. invented, right? Um, but you also have the tin foil hat wearing brigade, Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I like about this is you're not wearing a tinfoil hat, okay? And you've got a Brit you've got a British accent, you've got a Scottish accent, but it's British. Okay, so immediately that in me that it's one of those I, I trust you. <laughs> if you want, I can do the American accent for you if that makes it easier. But uh... <laughs> No, no, don't mate. Uh, obviously you've got the that UFO podcast, um, which is I really enjoy listening to it, mate. I've not managed to get through all the episodes. We're on what, number fifty four, fifty five now. Uh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm definitely not through all of them by any way stretch of, the, uh, of my imagination that's just down to time but congratulations in order your latest update uh i hear that a radio station has picked you up wants to start broadcasting your episodes is that right yeah um hot fm i won't pretend to know who they are because it's a spanish-based english language radio station and um, predominantly broadcasting in the ben and dorm area i uh, got in touch with me randomly just saying they're like yourself they've got a couple of guys who run the station have an interest in ufos and they want to start doing a broadcast and a podcast a couple of hours a week um, and asked if they could pick up the podcast to send out so it's not the huge uh, multi-million pound spotify contract yet but uh it's it's nice just to get it to a, a bigger audience and have some more people hear about the topic as well. So, but like you say, I, I've definitely not got the tinfoil hat on, and that, that's something we'll get to in due, in due course. Is why I started the podcast, definitely. Well, yeah, let's get into it, mate. From my perspective, as a layman, right? I am a layman. You know, I'm not well read or, or uh, I understand well the the evidence or the sightings or everything, and, and sort of the government in inverted commas conspiracies, cover ups, and all that. I'm not immersed in all that knowledge, but I do. I do like to try and uh, increase my, my understanding of it, and especially recently, it seems to me, we seem to be in a watershed moment of the availability and avail of information and the, the willingness of uh, governments, especially in the USA, yes. to start distributing information and most critically, evidence from absolutely verifiable, verifiable sources that there is that there is there have been ufo sightings legitimate ufo sightings going on for a long time to the extent even to the extent that i think recently what department of defense said said something along the lines of these things are not from this planet and that's a government body saying that i'm going to let you pick it up from you what what is happening how have we got to this moment this watershed moment if that's the right way of describing it yeah, absolutely. So I can imagine straight away your, your listeners being a, a military predominantly based podcast and we've had virologists and uh, British Lions and stuff on as well. So I can imagine the the core audience that you've got um, are looking at me going chubby Scottish guy sitting in a shed, probably his mum's house. Uh, that's why he's into UFOs. Okay. I am married. Uh, I do have children as well. Uh, I, could, I could prove that, but yeah, not for the podcast. Um so my, my interest in UFOs goes back to, to when I was a kid and I had a couple of sightings, some pretty good ones as well. And if you want, I can get into those at some point too. Um, but yeah, the conversation, you, you were quite right when you said before, it interests everyone to some level. You can't not be interested in are we alone on this planet and the universe, the solar system, whatever it might be. But like I say, your, your audience is going to have a lot of interest in the military background where this really kicked into a different gear for me, the whole conversation around UFOs, uh, December 2017, um, a, a group called To The Stars Academy, which this is where it's still got that conspiracy kind of out there aspect of it. Uh, former, well, I say former rock star, he's still a rock star, Tom DeLong of the band Blink-182. Obviously, he's been in different bands, Boxcar Racer, Angels and Airwaves. He, uh, as a side project to his music, put together a group of legitimate former government officials um 
Lou Elizondo, uh, Christopher Mellon, Jim Semivan, Hal Putoff, Steve Justice, some guys with huge pedigrees and big backgrounds. And I suppose like people, especially your audience, are going to want to hear things like Chris Mellon is the Undersecretary for Defence for the US. Um, Louise Elizondo worked for the Pentagon on what you would layman's would call the UFO programme, which the US government always denied they had. Um, and it came out that he'd worked on that from 2012 to 2017. And he ultimately left that to then join Tourist Stars Academy because he wants to get more information out to the public, which he believes they should hear about the subject of, well, we'll say UFOs quite a lot, but the acronym in the governments are UAP, which is Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. And let me say one thing straight off the bat, okay? I've got a, I've got a podcast, that UFO podcast, right? And that's not me plugging it, but I've got a picture of a flying saucer on it. UFO does not mean alien spaceship, Okay as much as the representation in people's heads brings that up, as soon as you say UFO and UAP, UAP to the government doesn't mean flying saucer, doesn't mean it's came from Mars, doesn't mean it's came from you know, another galaxy. That covers a whole branch of different potentials. And that's what Luella Zondo worked on as part of the Pentagon. So in December 2017, the, the New York Times ran a front page story that basically confirmed the US do and did investigate for all uh, for intents and purposes UFOs, even though they had always denied this at governmental level. We have no interest. There's no national security threat. We don't necessarily care about this. And that's also the UK government stance on it as well. Well, publicly, I know for a fact it's different in the background. Um, but they, so they released three videos uh, as coming out with this group to the Stars Academy uh, called Gimbal, Go Fast and the Tic Tac. Um, so, the, oh sorry, FLIR, Gimbal and Go Fast, and the FLIR camera is just, I'm guessing a lot of your, your listeners will know a FLIR, as um, you might know the acronym better than me, it's Front Something Infrared, um, which is just the way it's filmed, the Gimbal again is just the way it is, but it's basically three videos of unidentified objects flying in tran- different can, settings. Can I translate from Scottish into English? Flare. Please, yeah. Flare. Flare. <laughs> oh, flare? I'm saying flare, flare? yeah, flare. Flare, yeah. Flare. Like fr- uh, f- FL is forward looking. Forward looking, yep. that's the yep. one, yeah. Um, so I don't have a military background. So when I've got these guys on from the military on my podcast, it's yeah. So that's it's Primark and Primark for me, isn't it? Um, so <laughs> they, <laughs> they released these three videos uh, and the New York Times ran this front page story saying, look, folks, uh, essentially UFOs are, are real. And there's no doubt well, UFOs are real because when we say UFO, it's do you mean spaceships or do you mean something in the sky that's unidentified? Um, so... To the Stars Academy, I've looked to push forward through these really serious people. Lou Elizondo, uh, who is on the poster in the, the background there, I've got uh, Chris Mellon and co, that the government do study these and the people should know. Now, they do have quite a spin on very much talking to the American people because it's things they're trying to push through in, in the American Congress and through through their kind of political system. Um, as fragmented as that is at the minute and that's something that they do discuss how how compartmentalized things are over there as well but essentially with these three videos you've got um, and your listeners obviously can can go and look at these as well on on youtube they're all readily available you've got one which seems to be an object flying along tilted sort of on its side and then it turns and then the video stops rather teasingly before it potentially shoots off and they're all about 30 seconds long another one of them is just an object being tracked uh, and you hear the pilots talking in the background. Again, that's something your audience and yourself will have an interest in hearing what the language and what they're saying about these because they're of declassified military recordings. Um, it then shoots off at a rate of speed. And then another one of them uh, is n- more the most famous. It's an object called a Tic Tac because of just the way it looks. So it's 40 feet white cylindrical object that has been captured, auto-tracked uh, by the computer system on just above the seabed. And it is shooting along the ocean. Um, and they're just talking about the speed it's going. And so, yeah, there's a lot to these videos. And this is in the last three years, the conversation has absolutely changed that these are real. The government do study them. And the people of America and around the world have a right to know what these are, where they're from, and any potential threat, which they do to go into in quite a lot of detail. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that with, with uh, from from what I've read and watched and listened to, I mean the, the TikTok incident. You're talking about Commander Fravor there, right? Who, yes. Yeah, who is who has appeared on multiple interviews and programs to talk about that. And the guy, you can't you can't like dispute what he's saying. And plus, the um, 
it all, it's not just sort of human, a human storytelling element of what he's describing. He got all of the technical data backing it all up, video footage, et cetera. Yes. And what interests me at the moment is that all of the current information that's coming out and being made available. And, and it's arguably it's been forced to be made available because of things like the Freedom of Information Act and mm-hmm. just the availability of information, the, the capability to hack into systems and get this information if it's not released anyway. It's all there, right? But it's adding validity to all those historical stories. You know, you can go right back to all those historical stories up until five, ten years ago. You would have no idea about think, is that, just, Did that really happen or did it not? For example, the story of the, a fleet of, in inverted commas, flying saucers over, was it the Pentagon or the White House? Uh, Washington, you know, yeah, over the, over the over, capital, yep. yep. Yeah, over Washington. And what's also been released is uh, with that, and this is the 40s, man, uh, what's also been released with that, and, it's, and in the recent documentary, The Phenomenon, you know, is the footage of the actual military there. Again, footage of the military talk and military documentation and recordings from back then talk about it actually happened. Actual fleet of unidentified fly objects, which, I mean, you use the term, we, you know, that, that term flying saucer, like stealth has got stigmas around it. But you look at the footage now, look at footage from there, especially from certain elements, uh, so from certain, certain sorry, events, they, I mean, they do look like saucers. You know what I mean? Some of them do. What's become apparent, though, recently, especially you, you mentioned the Tic Tac there, is there's all sorts of different shapes and monstrosities, monstrosities cutting about. But what, what is, I think what is undeniable is it, there's, there's stuff out there. We don't know what it is. And what's been indicated by, uh, what has been indicated over the decades through, through the research that's been going on, and that's been made public, that's been going on, and also through stuff that wasn't, authorized to be made public like um oh, what's your man who worked uh in uh what's your man who, the the lunatic scientist who not does a lot of those the one who uh the one who worked on the the reactor trying to understand it he put a he put a turbine in his car put a jet turbine in his car oh America. bob lazar bob lazar um, and what they're all saying is, and in, including like the military aspect, like Commander Favor and other pilots and other, even just people operating the radars who have seen these things moving on radar, you know, not eyes on our radar. They're saying that things like this, we don't have the technology to be able to move like this. And if it was, if it was being operated, if these things were moving under normal propulsion, under normal circumstances, whatever was inside there wouldn't be surviving because traveling at 700, 800, 900 miles an hour, which is what they're estimated to be doing, hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour, and then banging in a right angle turn without stopping, without slowing down, you know, on a, on, swiveling on, on, a, on a pinhead. It's just not capable right now. Um, it's crazy. That, that- that Tic Tac event um, is, is something worth talking about if your listeners don't know. So um, 2004, the USS Nimitz and USS Princeton were off the coast of, of California um, near the Catalina Islands, that sort of area. They were doing military exercises. I, I may or may not get some of the, the distances and whatnot wrong. There's a lot to remember in this subject, but they were about 60 miles off the shore, I believe. Um, this wasn't an instant where a pilot saw a UFO. This was an incident that happened over seven to 10 days that has a ton of data, hundreds of witnesses as well. And as you talked about Commander Fravor, basically had somewhat of a dogfight with one of these up close and he described it in great detail as well. So essentially, um, I've interviewed some of the Spy One radar operators and the Chief Petty Officer at the time as well. So Gary Voorhees and Sean Cahill. Um, Gary Voorhees picked up these contacts on his radar system and he says himself, he, he just knew the number of contacts, the consistency and the quality of the contact on his Spy One radar, that these objects were real. It was told by his you know, supervisor at the time, take the system down, give it some sort of clean out and get it back up and running. These are more than likely glitches and you're kind of smiling and nodding as if, yeah, that's the kind of thing that might happen. Uh, so he, he knew it was a waste of time, but he done it, puts it back up and all that happened was the images became clearer. And he went, right, okay, so there's still these contacts. What do we do about it? And they were told, we leave it, we do nothing. So there you go. Um, then within a time frame, basically they were doing, uh, it was like military manoeuvres, uh, so like practice and, you know, war, such, war scenarios. And they sent uh, a couple of the pilots, uh, including Commander Fravor, who is, and, and most of these guys are like qualified, like top gun pilots, and um, the best of the best, creme de la creme in, in the world, trained observers, which is the main thing that to get across. Um, there's a bit of controversy around military 
pilots or military personnel better placed to report back UFO sightings? Well, they're trained observers on the most part. They can tell a commercial jet to something, you know, they shouldn't. Um, so essentially they went out to meet these things. So uh, Commander Fravor with his uh, wingman um, flew out and basically they spotted this tic-tac-like object buzzing about on, on the surface, just above the surface of the ocean, literally feet above it, um, really erratically. Like it was just firing about like a ping pong ball. Um, but they noticed there was something just under the water as well, which has never been identified either, um, that they say looked a bit like a B-52 bomber, but underneath, just in the fact that there was crests of breaking in the water, they could identify something had either just submerged or was just underneath the surface of the ocean. So whether it released this object, whether this object was interested in it, who knows, but th there was something under the water. The Tic Tac then he noticed seemed to notice him just by the way it reacted. He started a maneuver, which again, people listening to this will know better than me, but he started circling down to meet the object and the object mirrored him and circled back up towards him. They basically met midair and the object, he said, as he described it, perfectly um, tic-tac-like object. So imagine your, your tic-tac sweets, if anyone, tic-tac mint, um, 40 feet, no markings, uh, no windows, no signs of propulsion, no exhausts, no wings, um, two small protrusions underneath it, very small, almost like antennae. It stopped, looked at them, shot off at an incredible rate of speed. The object when it shot off, he reported, look, we've, we've lost it. Don't know where it's gone. It was reported at his cat point, or as the cat or cat point, basically a random point that's designated out in the middle of the sea that they're going to meet as part of their operation. Now, there was obviously no way this could have known where, where to go. And, and do you know what? There's always the chance that this thing just turned up there by pure coincidence, but it appeared exactly where they had plotted the, the scenario to, to kind of end up as well. Um, so these objects, it wasn't just one, that was one incident, but as part of this whole seven to 10 day period, there was dozens and dozens and dozens of them spotted, just hovering, watching the maneuvers. Now these were nuclear powered craft. Um, that's as much as we know, given you, you know things aren't declassified at that level to discuss what and what was not on these on these boats, on these ships. Um, but this happened over seven to 10 days. And when you talk about the speed these things traveled, um, what was also, uh, what came out later in the data that we've got some of is that these things were tracked by all I've heard as different organizations um, uh, with aerospace capabilities where they came in from the atmosphere and came down. They didn't just appear and they were tracked. Um, it, they were dropping from 80,000 feet to just above the seabed in less than two seconds. Now that's like you say, that speed that if something something should fall apart at that speed um, especially in our atmosphere and then they're just stopping and flying off so it's technology that again we go back to the christopher mellon undersecretary of the former undersecretary of defense for the u.s that this is not u.s technology and it's surely not russian it's surely not chinese so where is it from you know who is it who sent it um or potentially is it actually from here which is another question that's came out quite recently as well Mm. Yeah, just on the on the military acronyms and that. Just assume I I'm civvy because right, okay. Like what? Like I'm I'm ex army and I'm British army. You're talking about American Air Force, so Air Force is alien to me anyway. Like right, tack point, that's I don't fine. know. Tack points are rendezvous of some of some sort. We'd say RV. So just assume yeah, it's I'm just, it's just a random to... plotted point. Yeah, that they have to go out and get to. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I think as I recall, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a rendezvous point of some sort that it was predetermined. It was it was it was it was known to only the people with, who were taking part in the manoeuvres and the exercise, and it was you know it was stored digitally as I recall. It, you know, it wasn't yep. yeah, it wasn't like publicly available kind of thing, and they hadn't been to that point yet, no. and the tic tac object went there before the craft were to go there it's sort of new it's 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 a it's a, it's a strange one i'd not heard i mean i'd not heard the b52 reference before but that's just a that just is to describe the shape of the of the brakes on the water i take it the size yeah basically there was some sort oh, of size. wingspan yeah basically yeah. underneath um uh, there was rumors it could have been a pod of whales potentially but that, that there was no way of knowing for sure no way of knowing for certain yeah, and it, I mean, just to go back to your point, the interesting thing about this is, you, you know, you look, this was going on for seven to ten days in the uh, what Pacific Ocean? In the yeah, ocean? just off the coast of California. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's going to have seven to ten days out there. And as I recall from the from the uh, the information that was released, these sightings have been going on for the, a long time before that. I think I think one of the air air, air crew, one of the air, uh, the airmen who was on the ship that the aircraft carrier that Fravor went deployed to when they came back talked about it, he said they've been seeing them for weeks, been seeing this for weeks. And it just, you know, it just, it was sort of, it was Fravor's turn to be there and be on that ship. And then all of a sudden they had this, 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 this sort of close encounter. Um, and, and again, the reason this, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason this, this particular ice, uh, the incident is talked about so much is because of the, because of the evidence and the, and the number of people that were able to see it and the quality of the evidence available. But the reality is it's one, it's one instance over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of instances like this, right? Absolutely. And like you say, these were going on before weeks, months and years, but they're still going on now. Uh, and as and we keep hearing from people like Lila Zondo, uh, Christopher Mellon, when they, they do appear on documentaries like The Phenomenon, which I would encourage people to go and watch. It's probably the best UFO documentary that's ever been made. Um, it's got a really serious objective tone to it as well. It's got a lot of science, a lot of data, military data, military witnesses, um, really important witnesses, members of Congress are in it as well. Um, but these events are still happening now. They're, and they're being tracked, they're being analysed. What happens with the data, as you've said before, we're getting more and more coming out, is that in a recent uh, bill that's gone through Congress, uh, a UAP task force has been designated and designed, and that's been signed off. So within 180 days of this bill being enacted, we should have a declassified report from the Pentagon on what they know about the UFO subject. And that's not to say they're going to go and release 60 years worth of classified files, but we might get things like a best case assessment. Um, we may get some extra data released. We may get some videos, some more photos released. We don't know, but there's going to be an official report come out through Congress by uh, April, May time, I believe, was the, the latest it could come out. Now, I'm not going to kid myself on or anyone else that it's going to be fully declassified. Of course it won't. But anything else we can get from an official capacity. what we're And it's something that was crazy to think about a few years ago, but we are going to get an official US government report of, here's what we think about the UFO subject. Because like you've said, this is not, well, as far as we know, because you can't say over 100% in this topic on anything. It's not US, it's not Russian, it's not Chinese, it's not the big superpowers. Um, and especially from a US point of view, if this was US technology, what you're talking about is secret US programs, special access programs, which do exist. Everyone knows these black budgets do exist. You know, the stealth fighters were these at one point and all this technology, which is 20, 30, 40, 50 years still to come out, is in existence right now. But you're testing it out on not only your own soldiers and your own, you know, airmen, service women, all that sort of thing, but on nuclear strike groups that's very dangerous that if you've got something that can move at 2,000 miles an hour, what if something did go wrong? What about the human error element of that? If it is ours, if it's US technology, that could be disastrous. So I highly doubt that's what's happening. Yeah. And I think, I think the highlight here, again, we, we sort of, US, the UFO subject is, is, is very US centric when you think about it, just in yes. general. But I think the highlight here, and I think the, the, the documentary, the phenomenon right now on, on Netflix does a good job of doing it as well is, mm -hmm. is, is making the point of this is not US centric. It's just that the it, the US it, it's just more accessible information for us in the Western world. Similar sightings, similar experiences and events have been happening. I know in, in Russia and again around the you mentioned nuclear there, the the nuclear topic. There's a there's a the, there's a, a, a feeling and a, and, a, and a thought that uh, that I'm not sure this is correct or not. It seems to be like correct, but I don't know. It is that the the there was an increase? There's been an increase in UFO uh, sightings, UFO events, and experiences, and intervention into our own technologies. Right, um, that took a big uptick. It became really noticeable around about the time or immediately after that we started developing and using nuclear technology. Right, thirties. Mm -hmm. 30s 40s yeah and that has carried on uh, up to now and and again going back to the the, the mention of the russians go back to the mention of the americans there have been reported absolutely 100 percent reported military reported uh um interference with nuclear facilities so military nuclear facilities in america and in russia where military 
facilities have either been completely deactivated for a period of time while a, a UFO uh, experience has gone on directly over the facility. Or in, I think in Russia's case, the military facility was completely was activated without any launch codes or nothing, completely like remotely from whatever's in the sky, activated, brought up, you know, to the point of going to launch and then shut down without any explanation that the, 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 the base lost complete control of what's going on. Now, my only thought on that is, what also went on in the 30s and 40s is that there were huge advancements, advancements in technology, our own technology, because of the world wars. Mm-hmm. Huge advancement in technology. That's not me saying that we were able to develop this technology that we've seen. And, but what, what, my only thing about my mind that thinks, oh, was there actually an uptick in UFO activity, unexplained activity like this, or did we just develop a capability to be more sensitive to it? We were able to capture more of what was going on, especially where radar is concerned, you know, especially where video is concerned and fo- fo- photographic technology. It took a, ma- a massive uptick in 30s and 40s. Now, I don't think, I think, I think the only plausible, that's the only plausible alternative to the, they rocked up when we started with the nuclear bombs. Yeah, so there's so many different ways you could go off with this because there's so many different theories and it's it's how to kind of best put it down. One of the most recent theories is that um, these objects um, are actually from here. The, these also are from Earth. Um, that Lou Elizondo, who I talked about, who is obviously a, a man in the know, had an interview where he talked about what if it wasn't mankind? What if it was mankind's plural? And, you know, what if we weren't alone on this planet? And I suppose if you want to think of it, if anyone's seen Marvel movies and you've looked at watch Black Panther, when you've got this whole other civilization and society here on the planet that we don't know about because they're hidden away with this great technology. Um, and more and more, the, these crafts seem to be appearing in and around bodies of water. So there's a lot of theories that, that they are underneath the sea. And listen, it's not, it's not something I've looked into massively, but I, you know, there are a lot of interviews people can go and listen. And you hear about things like Atlantis back in the day and, you know, civilizations under the sea. It, all that kind of stuff starts to come into it from different people and whatnot. For, for me, the aspect of it is that there's two different things that, yeah, you're right. If it's our advancements in technology and you look at even what the Nazis done famously, and there's a reason that Operation Paperclip happened, that the US took over so many of their, the, the Nazi scientists, you know, Werner von Braun and, and all those guys to, to who made the V2 rockets and stuff. There was a huge leap in technology. You've got the argument, you know, where did a lot of that come from? Like the computer chips, microchips all of a sudden popped up and that that was quite a leap. But even, even still, the, the leaps we're talking about with the technology that's being observed, it's not going from an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 12. It's going from, you know, a, a chisel and stone to an iPhone 40. That's, that's the kind of generational or millennial leaps we're looking at with the technology regarding how it's, how it's observed and how it's captured. I think you're, you're potentially along the right lines, yeah, that we have just become more sensitive to things. Our technology's improved. I suppose, though, if you are an advanced species and you see, a, let's just say, a lesser species playing around with something that's, that's as powerful as, you know, atomic energy and nuclear weapons, you're potentially going to have a vested interest in that, particularly if you were sharing the same space planet. But even if you're from a different planet, if you've got some sort of observational technology that you could find that out, it sends off shockwaves, doesn't it? Out, out through the atmospheres and whatnot. So it's... Yeah, let, I, let's pull it back from the theory. From the th- I've got a theory <laughs> on it. I've got a theory on it, right? I don't want to pull it up though because I'll start losing listeners. But, um, <laughs> That's no, all right. What, yeah. what, no, 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 it's fine. What, what's, what I like, mate, is that 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe even two or three years ago, the conversation would be, are these sightings or are these events or these experiences that people and that people have been reporting for decades and the military seem to have experienced but then cover up for decades are these real that's not the conversation though they've been validated that's it's like yeah. there are this is happening there are unidentified aerial phenomena there are unidentified flying objects right that that and there are there are thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands of these events a year okay most of them can be explained most of them can be explained yes but a significant proportion cannot and this is like like what we're talking about now okay and uh, and that's, and what I like is the conversation. These are real now. Now, why? The question is now not is it true. The question is ah, oh, it is real. Why is it happening? You know. Um, now we talked about it being very US centric, and and I mentioned Russia, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure about China's experiences, but <clears throat> what about 
Oh, and on phenomenon, obviously, DL's uh, experiences in Africa and South Africa, Zimbabwe, and all that. Mm -hmm. No, unbelievable, unbelievable do uh, accounts of things that went on. And yeah. uh, well, oh, believable now, but just crazy, <laughs> absolutely crazy, um, and but undeniable. Now, what about UK? What's the what's the what's the history within the UK? Is there any significant history within the UK of sightings, experiences, events? So the most famous UK event uh, would be Rendlesham Forest, which, again, it brings back the US into it because it was a US military installation on UK soil um, in, in, the Rendlesham, in the Rendlesham Woods, where in 19... We've actually just had the 40th anniversary of it um, in December, where over a couple of nights, basically, uh, lights were spotted in the sky and the, the soldiers on base, who were on their kind of Christmas holidays as such, uh, went out to investigate saw the lights, came back, got some more, um, you know, colleagues to go out and look. And essentially it resulted in two of the, the officers, Jim Penniston being one of them, actually reporting back. There's no video evidence of this, but they reported back that they saw a triangular craft land kind of sort of three feet by three feet by three feet. What year was this? In, in 1980, December 1980. Um, so yeah, Rendlesham. And uh, he reported back that he he touched this object. There was hieroglyphs on the side of it. There's audio recordings of it available. That's that's the most evidence we have. There's no video footage or photographic evidence. But again, this is military witnesses reporting strange lights, strange objects, and then two of them going further forward into the woods to report that this object had landed and it was like a triangular shaped small craft in the woods. Um, something that has always been reported but never confirmed or denied was that the, the installation itself potentially housed nuclear weapons, and that's what you're talking about, that do these things have an interest in any nuclear capability? There's all sorts of reports they were scanning the area and looking to see what was going on, but that's, that's just all kind of rumour and conjecture. So that, that's the most famous UK-based event that we've got is, is Rendlesham Forest, but there are, there are a lot of them. But what, what is disappointing from a UK point of view is I don't know if it's just the British way and let's be honest, like you've just kind of said before, the subject can be hard to discuss because there comes a point you start to sound ridiculous no matter what you're talking about. It's just a case of there are events and sightings happening of what could be earthly origin. It could be others. It could be it could be Scotland. Listen, let's say Scotland's discovered anti-gravity and they're just keeping it secret. You don't know. And this is a thing. Maybe the Russians don't know, but it's a race for a technology that seems to almost definitely exist. And whoever gets control of that technology has a significant, you know, if this stuff does exist and the Russians have it or the Chinese or the US, it's an incredible advancement in tech. But from a British point of view, we're very quiet on the subject, which is, which is disappointing. Why do you think that is? Um, I, I, this is just my opinion. Um, I, I've heard there is a program that does study these in the background. And if the US have one and the Russians and the Chinese and various governments around the world have them, then it would make sense we do. I think it's just a very British way that people don't want to discuss the subject because when you say UFO, you immediately think aliens and flying saucers. And most people just don't want to discuss that because it is a bit of a wild notion to think there are other things out there that share this planet, other planets, different solar systems, different dimensions. It's just things that are, it's fringe science that's becoming more and more real. But how do you have that conversation without going down that route because it's all just theories and possibilities it's it's a topic that no one knows 100 percent what's going on yeah no you're right uh, but but it's a fringe science but it's a science nonetheless right but you're yeah. absolutely right which is why i try to step away from the that whole theoretical side of things because oh yeah it it, it I mean it they've they're valid discussions to have you know um uh, the, and, the, and the more intellectual, the more scientific, and more and the bigger size of your brain, the more valid that discussion becomes. It's not you and Andy on the uh, on HR podcast, right? But um, <laughs> yeah. But again, it 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 it's it, science, and these things are going on. You know. Um, uh, well, I was going to ask you then. Was it, oh, it, I mean, it could also be the case. It could also be the case that the, uh, in terms of the UK, is that it doesn't seem to be a lot of activity here. If if any you know and so if it, you know what, what you can't see can't harm you but i would be very surprised if there wasn't a uk office for to, to to discuss it i mean on the technology on the technology front bob lazar has you know he's he speculated on, on, on how he thinks the crafts work based on the based on his experience working on parts of of them yeah you know that the reactor and seeing them in the flesh in in yes. uh, in s4 area s4 
uh, Roswell. Yeah, there? that's the one. Yep. And his and his you know and his and his theory would explain how a craft would be able to move the way it does without the things inside getting just smashed about smashed that side and, and killed because the other thing to highlight here is along with a lot of the sightings and the reported events military are not military is that it includes the fact that there are beings in there are things inside that are living and that have been seen and even been interacted with outside of the craft in, a, in like by human people and in some cases children you know and by multiple yes. but it's not like single yeah. source you know it's like multiple people at the same time have seen these things land have seen the beings outside of it, and in some cases have interacted sometimes the interaction has been like in a sort of a physical sense and the other other times the interaction has been on a you know a, a, um, like a, a mind a, in the mind kind of uh, yes. experience telepathic which, yeah, yeah exactly and that's where and, and and those kind of areas become people start going what are you fucking talking about do you know what i mean absolutely yep um hang on what was it what was i talking about before i got to that oh yeah bob lazar the technology explained and and the way he, he explained the theory is that from what he's from what he understood of the craft because he got inside one didn't he he's able to see inside is that reportedly it, yep yeah reportedly reportedly right according to him and other people <laughs> Yeah. Um, is that the craft has a way of bending gravity, space time around yeah. it, yeah. and so which explains how it can move so fast. And in fact, he also went. He also, and this is the thing about Bob. He was describing this in like the seventies and eighties, and then the video evidence and the science now back up what he's saying. In that, the, he was even describing where the infrastructure for for doing that bending the gravity around the, the craft is situated inside the saucer. The, the, yes. the fucking sort of, I don't even want to use that term, so inside the craft, right? And it yep. essentially points down. So if you, you think of a classical flying saucer in the sky and it's sort of the, you know, it's sitting like a saucer with on, on, on a table, but it's in the sky, right? And the, the wide part is facing down, the narrow part is facing up. And mm -hmm. these, these, the infrastructure inside, the bits of the machine that do it, face downwards but that's where that's the way it propels itself. So it needs to, when it needs to propel in a lateral motion or the back, it needs to angle turn so it's on its side and then that bottom sort of a dish faces the direction it wants to go and he was saying that in the 70s and 80s and that is evidence now in the way some of these crafts move but not the tic tac interestingly not the tic tac but of those three videos i talked about at the start the gimbal that is how that craft moves that it's it's sort of tilted and flying through the air above the clouds they actually talk again on, on the the pilot recording on that um video that there is a fleet of them but they're only seeing one on the camera or of the footage that's been released. And then at the end of the footage, tilts even further, which there's been a lot of controversy around. Is it tilting? Is it just the camera moving? But it, it definitely seems to be tilting. And then the video stops. And like you say, that's Bob Lazar's talked about these things almost fall rather than move through space. And the way he's talked about it is if you put your a bowling ball on a mattress that bowling ball is going to be hard to move. But if you then place your fist in front of the bowling ball directly, you're going to push the mattress down in front of it, causing the bowling ball to move. And if you keep moving your fists one in front of the other, the bowling ball is going to roll towards you each time. And that's the effect that this, what this gravity amplifier, as he called it, is creating, that they allow these craft to move the way they do. Mm. You you get to talk to a lot of, uh, you get to talk, interact with a lot of um, these bona fide uh, uh, I don't want to say experts, but bona, bona fide, you know, legitimate people, military and not military, um, and not just in the US, um, but elsewhere on the subject, or, on this subject, who have either spoken to a lot of people about sightings or explained, you post a lot of information about sightings and experiences, or they've done, they've done it themselves. I've seen it themselves. What, mm -hmm. What's the feeling on the ground at the moment with all this change in the way information has been presented and availability of it? What's the feeling on the ground with, uh, amongst the sort of the experts in the field of, of what's, hap what's happening in terms of where are we going to go with this uh, as, as more information becomes available? It's still very split. Um, you've got your camp that if, if you look at uh, Lou, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. Now, there's actually been some developments in the last few weeks where it seems Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and potentially others have left to the Stars Academy. Um, and that's just through some very recent interviews. They seem to have gone a different way. And we're just waiting to kind of hear some statements from to the Stars Academy as to why. Lou said himself in an interview just um, a couple of weeks ago that 
two of the stars want to focus on a lot of an entertainment aspect of what they do and that's not what he's about he is very patriotic he is you know he's got his ndas he still holds you know different security clearances same with chris mellon and they are looking to push the conversation forward um, we've not used the, the disclosure word yet, but they want to push disclosure forward on, you know, what these potentially may be, get the conversations happening at a government and political level. Um, so you've got the camp, and, and that's very much the camp I'm in. I'm, I'm not one that talks about Nazi scientists under the ice of Antarctica, you know, with bases on the moon, right? That's, that's not my style. I like to hear that this is a conversation that's going to happen, and, and I think it does have to happen in the US first, the way it's going. It's going to happen in Congress. You want to hear these briefings being held more and more um, senators are being asked are being briefed on the topic as well you've then got other people within the community that don't like the fact the government's involved because it's that old big bad government they they don't want us to know however you, that's then a lot of the conspiracy theorists and I, I like you say i like to keep the conversation serious and objective as much as you can so 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 many of these sightings that have gone on and you know so many of these witnesses there's a lot of them that i can't say their stories didn't happen but for me they can be still be very hard to believe but then maybe that's because i've not experienced it myself so i'm in the camp and it seems to be a split 50 50 but I, i'm quite happy to stick with your lou elizondo chris mellon serious former government men who may be going back into some former government it looks like I, I would suggest in the near future um that are pushing forward bills through parliament bills through congress to, to get the conversation happening at those sorts of levels where you get classified and declassified reports on it as well. Um, it, it's very it's very compartmentalised from what guys like Lou talk about. And when you've got, I, I keep going back to Lou Elizondo, but this is someone who wor did work for the US government's UFO programme. He ran it. And it's not something that happened in the 50s, 60s or 70s. This happened 2012 to 2017. And it was it's all tip. ATIP, yeah. yeah, the Advanced Aero Threat Identification Program. And before that, it was called OSAP as well. And he has confirmed this program is still running now. The Pentagon has denied that, but he has come out and said that he, he knows for a fact it's still running. And that's then shown from the fact that they've now got this UAP task force on the go because, you know, where are you compiling this information? So there, there seems to be a massive split still in the community. You're always going to get people with some fantastic, I don't want to say crazy, but let's just say fantastic stories. Uh, and they may well just be that, but I think there is so much information, legitimate information from a, a governmental and military point of view that is, is the path to go down in this subject. Yeah, uh, and like you said, the important thing is to stick as close to the facts as you can. You know, you, you, you just end up getting into the weeds because all, all of the all of the potential theories and it just it just becomes wild, like conjecture, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but it's certainly going to be interesting five or ten years. Certainly going to be interesting five or ten years. I mean, it's it's natural for them to want to keep a lid on it, right? What, whatever the cause of it, you know, whatever the cause of it, whatever is behind the technology that we can't, we being the royal we, general public, and seemingly, you know, uh, the military can't explain, right? It, even if they are behind it, or and they're just making out they're not or something else is behind it. It's natural to want to keep a lid on it. For the same reason, you know, we, I think it's probably the years have come down, the, the, the timelines come down now, but I'm sure 10, 15 years ago, they used to say, like, the technology that we have as, as the public, that we have in our hand, the iPhone, you know, the Huawei yeah. phone, the flipping flat screen television, the GPS, and all of that, the smart cars and all that, right? Is that, that that's generally 10 years behind the actual technical capability mm -hmm. technological capability that the world has but they yeah. they but they it's just a case of the science the science and the scientists and the government and people behind it understanding it understand its applications understand its implications most importantly and then get to the point where okay we read it release this 10 years behind it i reckon i'd say that's probably a lot lower now i say it's like probably four or five maybe less than that now behind but with this technology talking about it is unknown they they you know they, they need they need they want to control what they understand from a security point of view control what the the inverted commas enemy or the the other superpowers think they have yep. russians and, and the chinese because they could see it they probably do see it as a threat if the us is the yes. only country with we has this technology in its possession whether they understand it or not that is a big potentially a big worry for everyone else korea china flipping uk 
Europe, you know, Russia, anyone, because it's it's such a crazy technology, you know, and, and it would be a it's a race to try and understand it, a, a, a race to see you can, through espionage get information on it and understand to try and counter that threat, you know. And probably the only reassuring thing is is that if the technology has been in possession since the forties when that when that first crash happened and they and they got hold of these craft. Mm-hmm. And the and the US still haven't been able to understand that power, understand and harness that technology. Because if they had, they'd be using it by now. Over fifty years, they'd be using it by now. You, you, the technology would have been introduced somehow, or they they keep it very well hidden, you know. Yeah, and I think that's it. Boils down to that argument of let's just say take everything out of it, you know, potentially aliens or that. Let's just say nonsense, okay, and keeping it really simple that you've got three yeah. superpowers: US, China, and you've got Russia. If, let's just say, the US have this new technology, which allows them to travel at thousands of miles an hour, it's world-changing technology. You no longer need aircraft, you know, you don't need fuel. You can use, you know, gravity waves and you can be anywhere in the earth within seconds or minutes, okay? It's, it's, all, it's all world and life-changing technology. The, you want to keep that secret from Russia and China. Or none of them have it and they all want it first. And that's why, again, they all want to keep what they know as secret as possible. And that's where a lot of these videos people have asked, uh, you know, Luella Zondo will talk about it as much as they can through his NDA. Why haven't we declassified more? Why won't you just come out and tell us? Well, he's still very patriotic and he's taken an oath, you know, to not disclose all, a lot of this information. The, the technology itself, or sorry, he worked in counterintelligence, which is trying to find out what the enemy he recently talked about knows about you. Um, which is a kind of interesting notion. They don't want them to know what they know. So how much of these reports get declassified is is going to be up in the air. But like you say, it is understandable because if Russia gets a hold of this first, that's that's game changing. You know, from a war point of view, from a from a tactical point of view, it's it, it's crazy to think of what what this could be done. Uh, they, what what you could do with this? They be they become they become so because this technology is so. I mean, we just talk. I mean, when we're talking about technology, we're talking about the only technology we think we know about that is in existence that we don't understand, right? And this is the this this uh, what gravity drive? What gravity drive did Bob Lazar describe Gra- it as? Gra- gravity wave amplifier. The, the gravity wave amplifier. Does. This ability to move very, very, very fast without without the whatever's inside the craft feeling the effects of gravity, right? That is star travel. That is getting to the moon in flipping five minutes. You know what I mean? That's getting across the planet. Yeah. That is getting onto an enemy position, destroying it, and getting back before they've even had a chance to react. Okay. So whoever gets the technology, if uh, gets access to use the technology and be able to um, capitalize on it, gets it in the wrong hands. And I'm not saying USA is the right hands. Gets it in the wrong hands, mm-hmm. then that power becomes the power. There was, yeah. There's no getting around it. They've got ultimate leverage over everything. You know, and and they become they become the there's no there's they get political control they get economic control because they've got the ultimate they've got a, not the ultimate a very 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 good weapon that there is no counter to on the planet at the moment in reality okay. and that, this is going to sound wild but it's this is fact and this came into force last year because all, all the, the rest of this all the rest of this is well, normal <laughs> well yeah that's it. absolutely yeah absolutely but the, the u.s launched its own space force last year there is a, a military wing called the space force um, and I, I don't know if you heard what they're actually calling the, the rank of the soldiers involved. They're going to be called guardians. This is all yeah, legitimate. You made that it's, up. No, seriously. That's, yeah, go, it's, this is all legitimate. This isn't opinion or cookie conspiracy stuff. You've got a US Space Force um, where the rank is the guardians. Um, so space is that new sort of battlefront. You know, satellites and, you know, pos- tactical awareness um, tactical powers or whatever you want to call it it's space and that, that's what they all seem to be going for so th- that would I, I would wonder if the US did have this technology then why are you still messing about with everything that they would be or if the Russians had it or the Chinese so that would indicate to me that none of them have this technology themselves they've not created it they maybe have something they maybe back engineered some stuff but I think it's a little bit like if you went back to the 1700s and dropped off a Harley Davidson motorbike, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're not going to know what it is, how it works, how to turn it on. They might now and again work out how the lights turn on, but then for them, you know, what's a light? It's it's that sort of that's what we're talking about. If you get a crashed craft of some origin 
out in Roswell, New Mexico in the 40s. That how do you back engineer that? How much can you back engineer it? So that's, yeah, that's, that's what you're kind of talking about now. But yeah, with the US having a space force, I think that was really interesting that they're looking for, as they, as they said themselves, dominance in, in space. Mm. Yeah, it's the next frontier, isn't it? Um, is there any indication that Russia or China have got uh, sitting on any um, unknown technology that came here somehow? Uh, as in there's a, craft, there's a lot of... The Russians are very good at keeping these things very secret. Not to say the Chinese aren't, but I always I'm amazed at how well Russia managed to keep this stuff under wraps. There's some some uh, photographs and videos of different potential craft, crashed craft um, that the Russians may or may not have. But again, it's there's nothing to ever say they were real or fake. Um, there's not a lot comes out of those countries. Um, there's there's very few experts that you hear of, especially from a US point of view or, or from a UK point of view that that know about that as well. I, I would say there's a reason all three of those superpowers keep their cards very close to their chest. Um, I, I, would ha- I would say they definitely have their own programs and they definitely have their own interests as well. You hear about things like potentially secret space missions in the past, and that's not me saying they're, they're traveling to different planets, you know, or anything like that. I mean, that there's, you know, you've got the Apollo missions, but then potentially Apollo missions that we didn't hear about, and then the Russians and Chinese potentially having the same as well. The Chinese just um, last year launched a satellite that went round the dark side of the moon, um, landed and came back as well, which we heard very little about. So um, they, they've got their own vested interest in all this as well. Mm, definitely. Um, what about you? What about the journey with you, with the podcast? So y- y- you obviously had an interest in this before. What? Uh, how, have you, what? How has your opinion of everything changed? Is, there any, is, it, is your mind being blown? When did you start? When did you start the podcast? Um, so uh, last April, um, I decided to start it when we first heard about we were going to have a lockdown that we thought would last a couple of weeks and then all that would be over. Remember those times? Um, and I thought if I'm going to have a little bit of spare time on my hands and not going to go anywhere, I've, I've always wanted to do a podcast and it would be it would be football or, or UFOs. Um, UFOs won out in the end. So um, I... <laughs> I started on the, the 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 path of UFOs, and I bought a microphone which sat in a box for a month, and nothing happened. And then eventually, in mid-April, I got in touch with a few different people. And um, Gary Voorhees, who was the spy one radar operator on the USS Princeton, got in touch with me uh, and said he'd be happy to come on and, and share his story. And it kind of went from there. Uh, it's it's been you know it, I don't know success is relative, isn't it? But f- for me, I always said I said to my wife. I remember when I had the idea that if if twenty people listened, I'd be happy, and it's a lot more than that daily now, which which is great. But my, my frustration, and this brings it back to a point you had later, was whenever you hear the the UK point of view, there's not a lot of voices from the UK actually on the subject. It's Howard Hughes has the Unexplained podcast, which um, he he's on talk talk radio quite a lot, and um, but there's not a lot from a UK point of view that doesn't maybe sound a bit crazy. And let me qualify that as well with, I'm not saying people's stories aren't true. I don't know, but some of them are so out there and so wild that at this point they are just stories and it's up to you to make up your own mind. Like with anything, I always say that. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts from a US perspective on the subject. And again, there were so many stories that I, I enjoy listening to the story, but don't necessarily put a lot of basis in the fact that they're true or they actually happened or someone's just not having some sort of psychological episode potentially I, I don't know but again i'm not there i don't know that they're not being abducted by beings and taken to far off star systems but i find it unlikely so i wanted to get to talk to you know former military witnesses um real experts people who have an interest in the subject and just have a conversation asking the questions that maybe don't get asked on other podcasts that i hear about uh, and that was the kind of idea behind the, the starting the pod and it's it's gone well so it's mega. I enjoy it, and like I said, it's a it's a breath of fresh air to um, have a have a you listen to a British, albeit Scottish, uh, a Scottish <laughs> voice uh, talking talking about a subject that's is interesting, but talking about it in a rational way. You know, as you just yeah. said, it'd be very it's very easy to go down that the fantastical route and on and, and, and like you're saying those sort of far fetched stories. Are they true? Are they not? When the reality of the situation at the minute is that we're quite fortunate we being you and I in this day and age where it's 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 quite easy to find people or people to to be become uh well known who they are doing the job of reputable honest well conducted 
investigations and research into whatever. And there are a hell of a lot of people that exist like that now where the UFO UAP situation exists, but also the stories and the first hand accounts of people who, that have been available throughout the decades, like Bob Lazar, yeah. for example, and like, you know, th those people in the forties and fifties, because there's still people who experience this stuff in the forties and fifties alive now, and they've given the accounts, right? Yeah. But what is very good now is, it, because of the, the age of information, the way technology is now, communication technology, it is very simple to corroborate their information with other people who had similar experiences, maybe in the same area or maybe the other side of the world. I mean, you look at the Zimbabwe situation, the Zimbabwe with the, you know, the school children there experienced that, school children and teachers experienced that landing and beings yeah. getting off a fucking UFO, right? If I was saying this 10 years ago, it sounds mental. I mean, but it still does. It, it still it does, does, still does sound mental, right? Yeah, but if you, um, yeah. for people who haven't seen the phenomenon, there is a story, and I, I don't understand why I've never heard this before, story of a UFO, flying saucer, lands at a school in Zimbabwe. All the kids are in the playground, they see it, the teachers see it, they go out, and they interact in various ways with this ship and with these beings. And these school kids come back together as adults and they all this, and the, the information is corroborated. And there's a similar site in a camera in which other country it was. There's a similar experience at another school somewhere across the other side of the world. And we're talking 60s, 70s, 80s now, I think. Similar site in, and they are, the, the first-hand accounts from them are almost identical in, in, in ways of the, the nature of the experience they had and what they saw, the descriptions of the beings they saw, descriptions of the, and this is a time where it was near on impossible to, for the, it would be near on impossible for these school children and teachers to, one, even be aware of each other, and two, discuss and have this conspiracy or we'll have two different sightings across different sides of the world. We speak different fucking languages, and yet we're yeah. going to see the same thing, describe the same thing, and 20 years, 30 years later, we're all going to come back for this television program and then repeat exactly the same thing exactly the same way but unbelievable yeah. mate it just it blows my mind i love the situation when it because it's just valid valid information out there super interesting it's just where it's going to go it really excites me yeah and, it's, and the fact as well it's there's not many walks of life where you take a child's word for something over an adult but the fact is like all these kids like they didn't lie they were, as you say, what they were like um, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. It was actually the teachers who lied because the teachers didn't want this getting out. And it's only now some of those teachers have came out and said they feel terrible that they called all the kids into the assembly hall after and told them they didn't see any alien, aliens. It was just a silly story and th their reputations were on the line. They didn't want to come out as an adult and say we saw a spacecraft and a being. And but there was government pressure as well, wasn't there? There was, there well, was yeah. pressure as well, wasn't it? It was government pressure as well, I remember. People have to watch a documentary. So one is documented the phenomenon, but number two, we need, I need to wrap this up in a minute. But number two sure. is, highly recommend, and your podcast, uh, That UFO Podcast, you're on Spotify, you're on Google Podcasts, you're on YouTube. Uh, I've got some of the episodes up on YouTube as well, yeah, more and more are getting, it's just getting them up there, yeah. So so let us know how people find it then. I find it all um, through the website. Yep, so I've got that ufopodcast.com. has got the latest episodes on there. You can follow on Twitter at UFO, UAP, AM. Um, it's on Facebook, that UFO podcast. On Instagram, that UFO podcast. But it's on Podcast Addict. It's on every podcast platform on, on the go. So um, please give it a look and a, a download. That would be appreciated. Okay. You've got a Patreon site as well, haven't you? Yes, um, patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast. Gives them um, a lot of extra content, some goodies and ad-free shows as well, which is very much a... Again, if people want to do that, it's very difficult times. I would never expect anyone to part with their hard-earned cash at the moment, but anything they can help to support would be great. I know, because I signed up this morning. Mate, love it. Um, listen, Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. No worries, mate. Thanks for the interview, bud. And uh, I look forward to chatting to you again, mate, and good luck. Uh, absolutely, anytime. Thank you, Hugh, and thank you to the listeners for listening. No worries, Mucka G. Catch you a bit. Thanks. <laughs>